All right. Thank you all for joining us so much. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a long day. Uh, for our second January chapter reading, uh, Mad Cat Flair, a quick tour of advanced tips and tricks with Scott Deloach. We're very excited Scott is here after some scheduling struggles since September, but he's with us for 2023. Uh, so we'll be jumping into that pretty quickly, but I've just got a few updates. So uh, we just finished our networking time from 6 to 7, 6.30 to 7. So thank you to everyone who joined us for that. I'm going over a quick welcome and announcements, and then we'll be handing it off to Scott, who is going to answer all of our questions about Mad Cat Flair. I'm just kidding. He's going to go over <laughs> what he prepared. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we'll see how far we get with all of our, our hopes and dreams for the future for Mad Cat. So uh, for those who don't know me or who are watching the recording, my name is Bethany Aguad. I am the president of the STC Florida chapter. Uh, we're glad you're here for our second. Usually we have one uh, educational program per month, but this month we're getting a bonus. So uh, thank you for everyone who RSVP'd uh, and is here to join us tonight. Uh, so I think we have someone else who's joining. So just for reference, we are the Florida chapter of the Society for Technical Communication, which is a professional society for technical communicators internationally. Uh, we are representing Florida, but we are not exclusive to Florida as we have members who are in other states as well. So you are welcome to join us from near and far as we have our, these meetings on Zoom. Uh, Julia, can I hand it to you for introduction and chapter news? Certainly. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Southwick, the STC Florida Vice President, Communications Chair, and Newsletter Editor. If you're interested in writing for our newsletter memo to members, you can email me at the email on screen. I'll also put it in the chat along with a link to our ideas page so that if you get stuck, you'll have a little bit of inspiration. We also have our own chapter YouTube page where you can find a playlist of all of our previous meetings. And those links are going in chat now. All right. Thank you, Julia. Uh, just a quick note about our upcoming meetings. So uh, this is our last program for January, but in February, we are hosting a joint event online with the Future Technical Communicators Student Club at the University of Central Florida. So that is going to be a young professionals panel where they're inviting uh, some recent grads uh, from the TechCom program at UCF to share their experience entering the workforce in the past couple of years. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, there's been a few things going on for the past few years. So it's been a different time to begin a career as a technical communicator. So we're excited to see uh, their specific insights into what their experience has been. And then in March, uh, we have our annual employment panel. We invite hiring managers and recruiters to answer questions and share their experience to what it's like to help uh, place technical writers in jobs. So that's something we do every year and we'll hope you'll attend whether you're job searching or not. It's always good to make connections and stay up to date on uh, what's going on in the, the hiring process in our industry. I also wanted to highlight a couple of volunteer opportunities. We are still looking for an employment chair. So that's someone who's responsible for helping connect recruiters with our members, helping send out job announcements. Uh, it's a great place to be if you want to stay in touch with people who are hiring in the field and also connect people with jobs, which I know is something a lot of us are passionate about. Uh, our industry sometimes feels very broad, but it's also very small. <laughs> We're all very interconnected. So it's a great place to just... Uh, to network with people and, and help people be successful, especially with uh, a lot of the news coming out of some very large technology companies in the past couple of weeks with, uh, with layoffs. I know there's gonna be a lot of people looking for work. So if you have a passion for helping people connect with jobs, uh, let me know, we are looking for an employment chair. We also are looking for a membership chair. So that's someone who's helping us connect with our members. So people who are already part of our chapter and finding ways to build community and, uh, you know, highlight our benefits and, and just make people feel like they're part of our chapter from near and far, uh, even if they can't attend every single chapter meeting. So if you have a passion for membership and community building, uh, let us know because we are looking for someone for that role. And I think without further ado, then I am handing it off to Scott uh, to start the program. If you have any questions about anything that I've mentioned, I am putting my email in the chat. And I accidentally had caps lock on, so I have shouted it into the chat. Uh, enjoy. <laughs> uh, Scott, I think I have given you permission to, to screen share. Let me know if you have any issues. All right, I'll turn it on. All right. So as far as I can tell, it's working, but if it's not, I'm sure you guys will let me know. 
Um, I am obviously going to be talking about Flare, and I will be showing you some things in Flare as well. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask questions as I go through. You don't have to say them to the till the end. You can if you want to, but uh, if I'm talking about something you're kind of curious about, it just jump right in. Uh, I'm kind of watching the chat. I'll go ahead and click on it so it's not red. All right, so that'll help me as well. So if you are more comfortable typing in the chat, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to do that. If you slip one past me, just kind of ping a message in there and it'll pop up again. <laughs> I'll catch it. Or if you want to just say something, uh, just, just jump right in and start talking. If you have a question, you want to use the voice instead. All right, so we can get into it. I did divide up the, the presentations kind of two pieces. We assume that most people, or at least half the people, will probably be more new to Flare, or maybe even don't really use it, or just kind of curious, you know, what does it do, what does it look like? So I'm going to start with that, kind of an overview, and talk about it at a high level for more newer people, or uh, non-users even. But then I will get into some tips and tricks for people that actually use Flare. So I'm going to try to, to split it up, but I'll be influenced by your questions. <laughs> so if there are more novice questions, we'll spend more time on that. And if there are more user or advanced questions, we'll spend more time on that. Um, if you do have a question or you got something a little bit more involved that is kind of hard to answer in a presentation, my email is right there. You can always email if you have a question about Flare. So uh, feel free to do that. I get lots of emails about Flare. Uh, but I'll be happy to answer your emails too <laughs> if you have a question about it. Or if you just want to talk about Flare, we can do that. As far as who am I, <laughs> just to introduce myself, um, my company is called uh, Click Start. I've been using Flare since the literally the very beginning. It's probably the first person to see Flare that didn't work for Madcap. I started with them when there were seven employees and I work as a content strategist, technical writer, front-end developer, and trainer. As far as Flare goes, I run the certification programs that people that get certified. Uh, I'm in charge of <laughs> getting them certified. If you're interested in that, we can talk about that. I've also written a book about Flare. Um, it's been around since version one, so now there's, and I think it's 16th edition. And I also teach Flare. So I've taught thousands of people how to use Flare, and most of my projects are on Flare, but not all of them. Uh, as far as professional societies, I'm a fellow of STC and a, a CPTD with the Association of Talent Development. So that's me, <laughs> but let's get into what is Flare. Okay, so our sort of overview for new people uh, what is Flare? Just we're going to talk about what is Flare, and, and as part of that, there's another product that Flare kind of works really closely with. They kind of have a suite, uh, and that's called Central. So I want to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about who use, uses Flare and why they use it, and how you can find some examples. Okay. So if we're talking about Flare at a really high level, if you want to zoom all the way out, this is one of Madcap's graphics, but I think it really helps to just sort of think about everything from a process perspective. Okay, so at a really high level, you might want to manage existing content, create new content, and if you're going to go through all the trouble of creating content and managing content, the whole reasoning for that is you want to share it with users. So we could call that deploying and publishing if we wanted to. And once it's out there, you want to see how people are using it. So analytics. If we look at this, as far as what does Flare do, what's its role in all this? Well, the heart of Flare is creating the content. So you can write content in Flare. It's a content authoring tool. But it does have a lot of content management features to it. I wouldn't say it's a full CMS by itself. A content management system, but there's certain certainly features in Flare that I'm going to talk about to help you manage the content uh, once it's inside of Flare. So this management part is where Flare overlaps with Central that I'll I'll show you in a second. But the heart of Flare has always been content creation, authoring. But something I should mention, something we were talking about just a little bit uh, before we got started. Uh, a big feature of Flare is you don't have to write the content in Flare. 
you can write it in other tools like Word or FrameMaker or outside of Flare as HTML and bring it into Flare. So it doesn't have to be created and managed in Flare. It could be external content that you're sort of reusing in a Flare project if you want to. Just wanted to mention that in case you wanted to do that. And then the getting it to the users, which you might call deploying and publishing, you can do that through Flare or you can do it outside of Flare. So, and that would be, maybe you wanna put the content on your corporate website. Maybe you wanna put it on an internet. We were talking uh, earlier about putting it in a SharePoint. <laughs> I heard a lot of opinions about SharePoint, which are pretty consistent. Um, a lot of people get frustrated by SharePoint, but. There are people that like SharePoint, so you can push content into SharePoint from Flare if you want to. Or if you want to push it into ServiceNow, Salesforce, Zendesk, you can. Something that's kind of new in Flare that you, know, you may not have heard much about or maybe you haven't had much experience with, but it's good to know that you can do this. You can create e-learning materials or you know, just printed training materials. So Flare isn't only used by technical writers as I'll tell you about, you can create e-learning materials. And if you do that, then you might want to push them into a learning management system, an LMS, <laughs> another one of those acronyms. So lots of options of getting the content out there. The analytics part is another piece that would be in Central. So Central, you could push the content into Central, which is a cloud service, kind of like a website, basically and users could view it through Central. You could host it in there instead of hosting it on, let's say, your own corporate website, or you could put it on your corporate website, but either one, wherever it lives, whether it's in SharePoint or your corporate website, internet, or hosted in Central itself, you could use Central for usage analytics, and I'll show you those a little bit later on. Or you could use, <laughs> as we were talking about, Google Analytics, or you could use both of them if you want to. I usually use both of them. So we'll talk about that too. So that's the really zoomed out, some people would call it the 30,000 foot view of everything. Now we can dig down a little bit. All right, so how does Madcap define Flare? So this is a quote uh, from the Flare help. It is a content authoring application, has a ton of features to it, most often used for technical communication, but as I mentioned, it can be used with uh, to create training materials or other things. And you can output in a lot of different formats. You can import content, as I was telling you, here's a, a bigger list. Most often people want to import content from Word, but you can bring in content from Excel or RoboHelp. FrameMaker, Confluence, Author, it says some other tools. Or if it's just HTML files, or XHTML files, data files, markdown files, those can be brought into Flare. When you're working inside of Flare, the actual authoring itself, you're working with XHTML files. So kind of what happens here when you import content is it would take, let's say, a Word document. And if you import from Word, it's Flare and Word together, they kind of team up to do this. They turn the Word document into XHTML. That's what happens. So with all those on the left-hand side, it's going to be turned into XHTML files. Um, obviously, HTML imports really well into Flare because HTML and XHTML are extremely similar. It's not a lot that has to change. But that's what's going on behind the scenes when you import. It's kind of a conversion from whatever, <laughs> whatever it is to XHTML, which is what Flare likes. Now, the things that you can create. So you have all this content in Flare and you say, well, you know, I wanna give this to my users. What can you give them? On the print side, a lot of people use Flare to create PDF files. So that's extremely popular. I would say most people create PDF outputs, but other print options, you can create EPUB documents from Flare if you want to. Not, not a lot of people do that just because it's, you know, it's not a big need, but it certainly works if that's your goal. And you could output to Word. If you're kind of curious, why would people output to Word? You know, why not just write in Word to begin with? Well, yeah, Word has, <laughs> has its issues. It 
it can be difficult uh, to work with. And there are a lot of features in Flare that aren't in Word. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, look at my list here. I'm going to focus on five of them, but uh, there are obviously others as well. But as far as why do people output to Word, the most popular is for reviews. So for a lot of people, they have to give content to the reviewers in Word and the reviewers look at the Word document. I'm not necessarily recommending that. That's not the most efficient way to do things, but that is the most popular use of the Word output. Now let's see, we have some things in the chat. I don't want to miss that, so let me <laughs> take a look just to make sure. Okay, uh, we had a question. If you output and you want to put your content into an LMS, so you have training materials, let's say you made like a little training module and you want to put in an LMS. All LMS systems, they're going to support, there's basically two standards. So SCORM is the, the oldest one. That's kind of the, the granddaddy of the standards. And a newer one is XAPI. So Flare supports both of those. So if you're if you want one or the other, you can pick which one you want. So it supports a score more XAPI if you like that. Okay. Does it work with SGML? As far as bringing in the content, you got to get it into HTML to bring it into Flare. So it needs to be in one of these formats on the previous slide. Let me click back to show you. Uh, so as a tip, if you have content and you want to get it into Flare and you're thinking, well, it's not in any of these, it's in something else. All right. Whatever it's in, <laughs> SGML or who knows, it's in some uh, whatever application. If you can get it out of whatever it's in, as anything listed on the screen, do that and then bring that into Flare. So... For example, if it's in application X and you're thinking, I got to get this into Flare, see if in, in application X, you can save it as a Word document or save it as HTML. Those are the two I try first. And if you can do that, maybe you know, check it out and see, <laughs> see how it looks and see how it's formatted, but you can bring that into Flare. Um, a lot of times you can do both. You can export as Word and HTML from an application. So if you can, I would try them both. Is one will probably look better than the other one, just depending on you know what's going on. And it doesn't take a lot of time to import. So I would try both of them if you have two options. Might as well. All right, so who uses Flare? Well, uh, lots of people, thousands and thousands of companies. The last time I heard as far as number of groups using Flare it was 25,000. I'm sure it's way more than that now. So lots of companies, lots of government agencies, a ton of universities. That's certainly worldwide. If you want to see Madcap's customer list, they have, you know, it's not a full list. It'd be a giant page, but the heavy hitters, the ones that they want to brag about, all these companies. And then they have you can go down into details <laughs> based on the type of company if you want to. So many, many, many companies uh, use Flare. All right, why are they using it? I, I think the real heart of Flare, it's going to boil down to two really big reasons, two strengths that I think. One is Flare is really good with content reuse, so single sourcing. Um, some of the features I'm gonna talk about, the main single sourcing features are variables, snippets, and conditions. So Flare, Flare was built from the very beginning to really optimize content being reusable, and we'll look at the examples. It also has some really good content management and reporting features, just to help you keep up with who's doing what, what content you have, how you're using it, how things are linked together. And that ties into a lot of great troubleshooting reports. So it is really good at content management as well. Um, on the other end, the things that you can create, that list that I showed you of the outputs, in addition to the print ones that I mentioned, the most popular online output is HTML5. But there are other online outputs. So Flare is really good about, I have a set of content 
And from that set of content, I have to make a lot of things. For example, I have to create a user guide and a quick reference guide and a technical specification and a website and who knows this other thing. Sure, you can do all that. And Flare, those things would be called targets. So from the same set of content, you can create and reuse the content to create lots of different outputs. The other big online format other than HTML5 that I'll mention, because it ties into multi-channel, and it ties into you want to push content into something, if we go back to our list here, is this one, clean HTML. So an interesting feature of Flare is you could create an output, an HTML5 output, and it's totally self-contained. It could have a menu, it could have a search. There are lots of cool built-in features that you can use. But sometimes you want to create something from Flare and push it into some system that maybe already has a menu, like a website or SharePoint, or it already has a search. So you're thinking, I don't really want to make this self-contained piece inside of this bigger system. I want to push my content into this bigger system and integrate it. So it, it shows up in that system's menu and it uses that system's search. You can do that with this clean XHTML output. So that's a way to push content into something, especially SharePoint, and make it look like other SharePoint content. It all fits in together. So that's a, an interesting uh, output type that gets overlooked, I think, clean HTML. All right, some examples. So I've been talking about it a little bit, but let's look at some examples. Okay, uh, the Flare Help, of course, is created with Flare. This is an example of the Flare Help system. This is the most recent version. This would be an HTML5 target. In an HTML5 target, you have two basic designs. There's two built-in designs, I should say. There's a third one that I'll touch on. So one of the built-in designs is used here in the most recent version of the Flare Help, which is called Side Nav. And in Side Nav, the navigation is, <laughs> as you might guess, on the side. In this case, it's on the left-hand side over here. It can also be on the right. Not too many people put it on the right, but hey, if you want to put it on the right, you can. So in Flare, if you want to customize how this looks, that's all built in. So the area at the top, some people call it a header, some people call it a banner. You can customize how it looks. The navigational area, you can customize that. And that's built in with a feature called a skin. So this is a very popular design. It's hard to say which one's the, the most popular. I'd say used to be this one was the most popular, but the other one's gotten really popular again lately. So I'd say they're kind of 50-50. The other built-in layout or design is used here. I'll go to a topic and you can see comparison. Uh, this is an older version of the Flare Help, and it uses the top nav design. In a top nav design, the navigation is up here on the top, as you would expect based on its name. Same thing, you can customize what this looks like in Flare using, in this case, a top nav skin. So if you like this layout, Ignoring, you know, the colors and everything, you say, well, I don't want it to say Madcap Flare. Of course, you could change that. It doesn't have to be blue. It doesn't have to be white. That's all up to you. But if you like this layout, then you could use the built-in top nav skin design. Or if you prefer this one, you could use the built-in side nav design. The other option is, well, maybe you look at them and think, I don't like either of them. I want to make my own design. Sure. You can have what's called a skinless design where it doesn't have the top nav area or side nav area. It doesn't have this little banner here or this area on the left at all. It just has this content area. And then you can do whatever you want. So if you want to look totally different, sure, you can. So not only can you drastically customize side nav, and top nav, you make your own design or not even have a skin, which would be very similar to clean. HTML. So a lot of design options built in. Uh, some other examples. Madcap has this customer showcase. It'll take it a second to come up. 
So these are all live examples from real companies that really do use Flare. And you can go out and take a look at them. And there are print examples out here and online examples. And they're constantly adding new ones. So this is a great way to sort of see what people are doing with Flare and who's using it. And if you use Flare, this is a great place to go to get ideas. So, you know, it's created with Flare. So if you see it out here and you think, I want something like that, yeah, you can obviously do it because they did it. So you can check this out, the customer showcase. I'll have the, the links to these things on one of my last slides. It's all together so you can see it. So don't worry about that. In fact, the whole presentation, I'll have a, a handout for it that'll be available on my website and I'll send it uh, to you guys as well. So you'll have that. So don't worry if you <laughs> didn't catch the URL, if it's kind of small and it's hard to see, it'll be in the presentation at the end. All right. So how about cool features? Well, Flare has a lot of features. This is just kind of a, a list that I, things I think are cool. Now, again, I don't work for Madcap. I just, I'm a business partner with them. So these are just things I honestly think are cool. It's, it's not, you know, Madcap doesn't tell me to say anything. And if you guys like Flare or if there's something you don't like about it, you're not gonna hurt my feelings if you criticize it. <laughs> because again, I didn't create it. I'm just a user just like you. So these are the features I wanna walk through. I touched on a really high level, variable snippets and conditions are all tied to single sourcing. And we can talk a little bit about micro content and we can talk about reports. Let's see if I have a comment in the chat. Let me check that out. Yeah, the, the customer showcase is really neat. And like I say and Jessica, they update it really often, at least monthly, there's new ones out there. So that's one of those you, you kind of want to loop back and check it out. Um, maybe you're getting frustrated, think oh, it's kind of boring, or I need another wow. <laughs> now everyone's used to the site. You know, how am I going to impress them again? You can go out there and, and see stuff. Uh, another thing that I'll, I'll mention, because uh, you guys reminded me, and uh, if I don't have it on my, my links slide, I'll add it for the handout. There's also a, a templates page. So if you're starting out with Flare, maybe you've even seen um, in the customer showcase, like let's say you're out here and you're looking at something, and you're thinking, oh, that's really cool. Like, let's say this black ball, I kind of like that. Well, once you find one that you kind of like, you could go to the templates and you know, I've been doing this a long time. Um, <laughs> so I know this is based on a template. So you could download the template and you're already more than halfway there. Now it's just a matter of changing, obviously the words and the colors and the images and stuff, but you've got that basic layout from the template. And there are almost 20 templates that you can use as a starting point. And they add new templates often as well. Oh, thank you. So there's the templates link in the chat, but I'll make sure I have it as well in the uh, presentation. Uh, before I jump into the cool features, any other kind of high level or kind of I'm new to Flare questions before we start focusing on specific features, do you have any kind of general questions that you, you want to ask or check on? Just want to make sure I have it. So uh, I have a question, which was mine when I first uh, started learning Flare, which was uh, I, you know, saw an overview of the features. I was like, this all sounds great. How how hard is it to learn how to write? Do I have to relearn how to, how to write <laughs> if I've been working in Word uh, before I can start taking advantage of all of the features? I think that's a, a really important thing. I think a lot of people overlook that um, because Flare and a lot of other tools you know, similar tools. People typically say they're, you call them topic-based authoring tools. And it's not common that people have a topic-based writing approach in a tool like Word or FrameMaker. You're more writing in a, a document-based or even chapter-based maybe. But in topic-based, if you look at, at the output here, now, when you're working in a tool like Flare, you're thinking at this level. You're thinking, okay, what should be in this topic? 
and the topics are pretty self-contained. In other words, someone should be able to read a topic and it makes sense by itself. There may be some additional supporting information or possibly background information that would really give this more context, but you should be able to read a topic and it, it makes sense, kind of like, again, a chapter in a book should make should be standalone to some extent. But if you're not used to that, that is a big part of going to any topic-based authoring tool. Um, and depending on how long you've been a technical writer, I mean, there was a time, if we really go back, before even document-based, if we go far enough back, people used to be, write more system-based. You just wrote everything about the system. And then it became more user focused and we would write more document based and then more chapter based and now we're more topic based. We're already seeing another transition. <laughs> so if you're not used to topic based, the next one is going to become even smaller, which is going to tie into micro content because now we're coming micro content based and that's really being driven by mobile um, writing. So there's another change happening right now. <laughs> so if you're not used to topic based, uh, better catch up because we're moving to micro content and mobile based already. Any other questions or comments that well, more overview type things before we get into the specific features? I just want to make sure everyone has a chance in case something's on your mind. Okay. So I'm going to tackle these in orders in order as they're listed here, and I'm going to demo them in Flare. And we can start out with the first one, the list, the variables. Okay. So variables in Flare, like in a programming language, it's something that you want to, to refer to. It's standalone. It can be updated. And it's typically reused. In Flare, variables are text only. You can type in what that text is which is called the definition. So a variable has a name and a definition. And it can also be a built-in dynamic date. And we'll, we'll take a look at those two different types. So some sort of text that you type in, some date that might update automatically, like today's date could be a variable. A variable employer can also be a reference and a classic example of that if you're kind of curious. Uh, in print, this is where you see these the most, uh, in the header and footer, maybe of a print document, maybe you want to put the, the name of the chapter. Okay, so let's say that the chapter starts with the heading one, each chapter starts with the heading one, if that's how you set it up. Then you could tell Flare in the header or footer, hey, find the most recent heading one and automatically update the header or footer. Kind of like a field, variables are similar to fields in Word, if you're familiar with that. So it could be more of a reference. In that case, that would be typically called a running heading variable, or as I mentioned, a date or text. A really cool thing about variables is they can have multiple definitions. So a classic example of a variable is a company name. Maybe you want to reuse your company name all over the place. You, know, you refer to the company all the time, or maybe a product name. The downside of if you type it in, let's say you type it in 50 times, well, if the company name changes, you're going to have to change it 50 times. I don't really want to have to do that 50 times. Or what if I miss one? I'm going to be worried about it. And you might be thinking, well, how often is the company name going to change? All right, it might not. But if you go ahead and make it a variable, if it does, you only have to change it in one place. But think about something like product name. Well, technically, Madcap. Flare is called Madcap Flare right now, 2022 R2. Obviously, when there's a new version of Flare, it's going to have a different name. I would guess it's going to be called Madcap Flare 2020, 2020, 2023. I think that's a safe guess, but we'll see. So what if you did type in the product name again 50 times? If you made it a variable, you just change the definition and everywhere you typed in is updated. Or a phone number that, that might regularly change. Variables are good for that. But if we get back to this idea of the multiple definitions, what if you have some content, but you need to make different user guides? Maybe your company makes four products. They're all really similar. They're kind of versions of the same product. 
and and let's say just for my example you want to make user guides so i need to make four user guides for four different variations of the product and when i mention it by name i want to have the the name of that version of the product let's just call them a b c and d you can make a variable and name it product name and type in all four a b c and d and tell flare hey when i build a everywhere i use a variable make it say a and when i build b and c and d it automatically has the right product name rather than you having to change it so that that's a big thing yeah you could call them text entities yes if you're more on the uh uh, XML side, <laughs> you might call it that. I mentioned in, in Word, they might be called a field. So it's a similar concept that you see in, in other tools, but super useful in whatever tool you're using. So let's take a look at them, how in Flare we might create these and how we might use them. I have a Flare project. Okay, so I have a Flare project open. And this is what Flare looks like. Um, you can have as many variables as you want. And they can have as many definitions as you want. In my example, uh, I made up the example of having a product name variable with four definitions, which I just called A, B, C, and D. But you could have 500 definitions if you wanted to. Variables are stored in a set. And you can have as many sets as you want. So they're over here. Now, my screen may be a little small, so I'll just kind of describe things in case it's hard to see it. So there's a folder named variables, and I have a variable set in this project named variables. You can name the variable set whatever you want. Uh, variables seem like a pretty simple name, so that's what this one is named. I'll double click and it'll open. All right, so in this variable set, there is currently one variable. It is named phone number, and it has one definition. So my example with product name, having four definitions we could do that but what i'm going to do in this one is i'm going to type in um, company name so in this sample project this is one that we use uh, when we teach uh, flare this would be used in the intro class the intro class for flare is free so if you want to sign up for that you can go through it and this is the project that you'll see so in this project, it's about different cities. We're pretending that we work for a travel agency, and the name of the travel agency is Mad Travel. And we know that we're going to use our name Mad Travel a lot. So we're going to make it a variable. Okay. In the variable set editor toolbar, there's a button. I'll describe it. It looks like a piece of paper with an X on it. It has a little plus sign. So that's the add button. We click add. And it makes a new variable. It just names it new variable. We're not going to leave it named like that. I click on its name and we can edit it. And since this is our company name, I would name it company name. Now you can name it whatever you want, but it seems descriptive. You can put a space in the name or a hyphen. I just typed it in as all one word with a capital C and N, but that's up to you. You don't have to name it like that if you don't like it. And the name of this company, as I said, is Mad Travel. So I'll type in the name. And we could use that anywhere we want. I'll use it in a second. But just to, to show you the other options, I was telling you that a variable could have multiple definitions. If I add another one, which I will name product name just as an example, go ahead and name it the same style. Okay. And I'll type in A as a definition. Now, I also want B, C, and D. Okay. Just to do that, we highlight it. There's another button in the variable set editor toolbar. And it looks like a piece of paper with a plus sign and a really little book. And that lets you add alternate definitions. So I just click there and B. The alternates have a gray background. And I could do that again for C and D. So this one's going to have as many definitions as one. In this case, three additional ones. The date one is a piece of paper with a really small clock and a plus sign so that would be a date variable and when you click on it sometimes you have to double click on it you have to type in the format it has a little information icon that shows you some examples and <laughs> as we were talking about it follows what's happening here is, is they're trying to follow some conventions as how you would type in the date format 
And you have to use, for most of them, lowercase letters, but some of them are uppercase. So kind of annoying that they're kind of picky about that, but they're trying to follow the standards of doing this. So this is one of those places where the standard might seem dumb or um, kind of out of fashion or whatever, but that's the basis of it. They're trying to make it follow what, you know, someone else has already set up like this and they figure, well, that's how it's normally done. So that's how we do it. So you have to type it in in the format here that you want. So then you want to say the month and let's say the day and the year. And that would put in today's date when we insert it and we can save it. Okay, so different types of variables. I'll close our variable set. And then to use a variable, I'll just go to a topic. All right, so anywhere I want, I could use any of those variables. I went ahead and put in a date variable. A lot of people wonder, you know, what's the use of a date variable? You can guess when I might use the name of the company. You know, anytime I want to type it in, I would use the variable. And I gave an example of using a heading type variable and a header or footer of a page layout. But the date one, I see it used a lot in policies and procedures. Now, this isn't a policy or procedure, but just to give an example, a lot of people have something that says like date modified. And they want to put in when this topic was last modified. And you could do that with the date variable. So we could insert our date. Okay, here it is. Our, remember, our variable set was named variables. And we can pick our date variable there. It's going to put it in. Uh, there, there is an option with the date variable if you're going to use it like this to tell it to show the last time this topic was modified and saved. And it's right here, update. So in this example, I would want update to be on file save. And that way, automatically in the topic, the next time you change that topic and save it, it's going to have that, that date. So that's the secret behind that. Now, of course, it's today <laughs> because I just put it in there and saved it. But three weeks from now, if we haven't changed it, it's still going to say today. It would only update when you change this topic. That's the way you might use it, a date variable. The last part of the, the variables that you might be curious about, what about the one that has multiple definitions? Okay. Well, in that example, I said, maybe you want to have four PDFs that you're building like a, a user guide about product A, B, C, and D. Okay, right now I only have one PDF target. I would need four of them. Now, you can make four. You can make as many as you want. You can have thousands of targets if you really need thousands of them. Yes, yeah, so I have two of them now. I just copy and pasted to make them. And I'll just name this one product B. So I just named it B just to make it more clear. So in a target for the product that I've just named B for simplicity, then I would tell it, hey, when I create this PDF, everywhere I've used that variable, I wanted to say B. And that's done in the target on the variables tab. Any variable that has multiple definitions, you can pick which one you want. So this one should be B. And then automatically it's going to make it say B everywhere it's used when we build PDF B. And of course, in A, C, and D, we would do the same thing. We would set it to A, C, and D. So that's right, that automates it. Once, once you set it correctly, you never have to worry about it again. You don't have to think, oh, okay, it says A, I'm gonna create this PDF, and then I'm gonna do a find or place and change it to B, and then save that, and then I'm gonna change it to C and save that, <laughs> like you might do in Word or something, or some other tool. And here it's, it could be automated once you set it up, you're, you're set. Great. Yeah, that's another good use, the last published date. If, if you want the same date in all the topics, then yeah, that's another way to do it, Jessica. That's a great, great idea. It just depends on if you want it to be per topic or for the whole thing. 
yeah. Uh, sometimes you want one, sometimes you want the other, but that's a, another great, great idea. All right, so I'll close that. That's a little bit about variables, one of the cool features. Uh, another cool feature is snippets. Okay, so a snippet is the idea of what if you have this block of content, whatever it is, a snippet can be any type of content, but let's start with probably the most common use of a snippet. What if you have a note? This comes up for me all the time. So you have this note and you need to use it a lot. So it's a really common note. It's, it's something you're constantly using in different topics. You could make that note a snippet. And then every time you want to use the note, you insert the snippet. Let's say you use it 10 times. Okay, so I've used it 10 times. And then I realize, oh, there's a typo in the note or I need to update the note. I just open the snippet and save it. And then everywhere I've used it is automatically updated. I don't have to find them and update them. In this case, I don't have to update it 10 times. I update it once. And then when I save it, I know that they're all updated. I don't have to worry that I missed one they're all updated. Within the snippet, you can have formatting. So if you have a special style for the note, of course, you can apply the, the style to it. But a snippet, as I said, can contain anything. That's just one example. Maybe you have a procedure that you use multiple places and it's a numbered list or something. Sure, that could be a snippet. A snippet could have a, an image in it. A snippet could have a video in it, any type of content. It can be as big or as small as you want. Okay, so let's take a look at a snippet. Okay. So each snippet is stored as a separate file. And you can have as many snippets as you want. And Flare likes to put them in a snippets folder. But anything here in Flare in this content folder, you can put it wherever you want. So by default, Flare is going to organize snippets in a folder named snippets. It's going to put style sheets in a folder named style sheets. It's going to put images in a folder named images. But if you don't like that organization, you have something you want to use instead, sure, you move it around all you want. Doesn't matter. So as a snippet, I'll just open our topic again. Let's open up a topic. All right. Now, remember, we're pretending that we work for this company called Mad Travel. So maybe we have this information about different cities because we're trying to sell people vacation packages or something. Okay. So we might have some little blurb that we want to put in here, like, need a vacation? Call us today. I I'm just making this up. <laughs> so call us today. So we could type that in. And maybe we want to have this in lots of topics. And maybe it's even formatted. So we'll give it a style. I'll just pick one. Okay. Pretty eye catching. You could make it look cooler than that, but <laughs> that just makes it stand out. So I've realized I need that in a lot of topics, maybe all of them. And maybe sometimes it's it's here, sometimes it's way down at the bottom of the top. And maybe I move it around, but I want it to be in there. And I don't want to have to copy and paste it because if it changes, I have to update it every place. So we could make that a snippet. And this happens really often. You sort of realize after the fact, I want to use that in multiple places. So right now it's in a topic like normal content, but now I've realized I actually want to reuse it. Well, we can turn it into a snippet. So I've, I've selected, I just highlighted it. And here in the home ribbon, there is a button pretty much in the middle of the screen. It says create snippet. So we can do that. And I'll just name it. It's kind of a call to action. This is you know, hopefully they'll contact us and buy a vacation. So I might call it call to action. And that's it. Now it's a snippet. And now it is in the snippets folder. Here it is. There it is. So if I change it here, we'll, <laughs> we'll be even more demanding. Call us now. Okay. And maybe you want to format it, because I mentioned you could format it just, just so you can see that it changes. 
All right, so I changed it, I save it. And it's update. And I think, oh yeah, I need that in the, the New York topic, okay. So here in the New York topic, maybe we want it right here. All right, let me just drag it in there. there. And now I have it in two places. But if I update the snippet, then both of them would be updated. Maybe we realize that's a little too strong. So we change it back. And it updates. Okay, so as I was mentioning, you can have as many snippets as you want, and any type of content can be in the snippet, and they can be as big or as small as you want them to be. And inside the snippet, you can use formatting or whatever you need to use. Mine, mine just has a yellow background. It's not that exciting, but it could be more exciting than that one. All right, still talking about single sourcing, but from a different perspective, conditions. So variables and snippets are really good when you have content that you wanna use in multiple places. And a lot of people, when they're new to Flare, they, they do kind of wonder, like, and maybe you're even thinking this now, wait a minute, the snippet can have any type of content in it, it can have formatting in it, seems pretty cool. The variable is just text, not really as exciting, seems kind of boring. And a lot of people go in this direction when they learn about variables and then they learn about snippets. Snippets seem like the cooler one, so why would I bother using variables? I'm just going to use a snippet anytime I want to reuse content. Well, you could, but the key thing about the variable I just wanted to mention is that it can have multiple definitions. So that's the big advantage of a variable, like the A, B, C, and D. That's where it's big strength. So sure, it's text only, but being able to have multiple definitions is huge. Can't do that with a snippet, but a snippet can be any type of content. Now, thinking about a different perspective of single sourcing, sure, variables and snippets are great if you have content you want to reuse, but thinking about the outputs, which in FOIA are called targets, and right now I have three, I'll just name this one PDFA to kind of match my example. Okay, so right now I have three. One is named HTML5, one is named PDFA, and one is named PDF. B. You can name them whatever you want. You'd probably give them more descriptive names like A, user guide, B, user guide, things like that. But this will work for me to talk about it. Well, what if there's some content that you want to use in one of these targets, but not in the others? Or an even more classic example, what if there's some content you don't want to show up in any of the targets? Now, that might seem a little odd at first. You might think, why am I going to bother having content that I'm not using in the output? <laughs> Let's put a time perspective on it. Then it'll make more sense. What if there's some content that you don't want people to see right now or yet? So using this project, there is a topic here named Toronto. So I'll pick on that one. What if you're still writing the Toronto topic? So as a company, Mad Travel, we just started offering trips to Toronto. We haven't done it yet. They, they, let's say that they will become available February 1st. But we're already writing about it because February 1st, we've got to be ready to roll. Well, I'm, I'm writing about it, but I don't want people to know about it. We, we update our content every day. So I have content in here about Toronto I don't want people to see yet. That's where the condition feature comes in. So in that case, what we would do is make a condition tag, and I'll, I'll walk through these steps in just a second, apply the condition tag to the Toronto topic, and then we can tell our targets, hey, anything tagged with this tag, don't include it, and it strips it out completely. So this really classic example, in this case, content you're still writing, a lot of people name this condition tag draft, so that's what I'm going to name it. Sometimes people name it hold or whatever you want to name it, but classically it's called draft. Okay, so I just click the new button, the piece of paper plus sign, and I'll name it draft since that's my example. And most people make this one red. 
You can pick any color you want for the condition tags, but I'm going to leave it as red because that is its most likely color. All right, so I named it draft. It's red. I don't want people to see that Toronto topic. So I'm going to right click on that topic and go to its properties. All right. And on the condition text tab, I'm going to check a little checkbox or draft. So this is how you apply the condition tag to the topic. I'm telling it, hey, you're draft. And that's where the color comes in. The little box there changed to red. So the color is just a memory aid in Flare. When I see something with a red box, it's to remind me in this case, it is tagged as draft. All right, so we tagged it. We could go into our targets. In my example, we need to do this in all three of the targets. I'm just gonna do it in one. It's done the exact same way. So I don't think we need to do it three times. So in each target, there is a conditional text tab. And I would say, exclude anything tagged as draft. Now, if I build this target, anything tagged as draft, there's only one thing tagged right now, the Toronto topic, it would be excluded. So it wouldn't be in the output. All right, February 1st comes. We're done. You know, the topic's ready to go, and we just launched all of our cool vacations to Toronto. We want people to know about it. I go to the topic, take off the tag. And now if we build the target again, now Toronto is included like everybody else. And now everyone finds out that we offer trips to Toronto. I don't know if I'd want to go to Toronto right now, but maybe they're, <laughs> they're buying it for the summertime and they can go into Toronto and, and everybody's happy. So that's how condition tags are normally used. If you have content in your project and you want to exclude it, you can do that. There are more advanced ways to use condition tags. So that's a very, very common way. And that's another, something you've probably noticed. We talked about it a little bit in the chat when I was talking about variables. These features I'm talking about in Flare, conditions, variables, even in some programs, snippets, it's not that these are unique to Flare. You see them in other tools and they often work the same way. So you may have worked with conditions before as well. The cool thing is if you're used to them, you can keep using them in Flare. Uh, for some of you that might have used a tool that had something like variables, conditions, or snippets, once you start using these powerful tools and you're working in a product that doesn't have them, that's when you really miss them. Because <laughs> once you start leveraging these more advanced single sourcing features, you really start to appreciate them. And that's what I, I really like about it. All right, so that's conditions. I just have a couple more to talk about. Go back to presentation. And that would be the other two I want to talk about are micro content and reports. I'll touch a little bit on some cool, more advanced things you can do in Flare, which would be automating and customizing. But micro content. So the idea of micro content, relatively new feature in Flare. Micro content can be used in a lot of ways. I'm going to focus on how it can be used to enhance the search because that's usually how people start using micro content. But this is a huge concept. If we look in the Flare Help, so the example I usually use in the Flare Help is if we search for the word images. Okay, so that's a pretty vague search, images. Hopefully, you know, if I'm curious about inserting images, I'd search for something like insert images or something. But what if I just search for images? It still works. Okay, so pretty broad search. So in the search results, we have this area on the right that's giving us some information about images. And we have this information sort of at the top of the results list. In this case, it's a video. Both of these boxes here, the video here and the area on the right are examples of micro content. So, the team that writes the Flare help, they wrote this micro content block and associated it with the search term images. They created this micro content block that has a video in it and associated that with the search term images. So when I search for images, Flare realized that this micro content block 
and this micro content block were associated with the word images and automatically showed them in the search results. Pretty cool. Now, this isn't something that's specific to just you know, help authoring, if you're thinking about that. This is something that you see in search tools like Google. So I wanna show you that in a second. This is a huge concept outside of our field, but I think that we have a huge contribution to this uh, and we should be heavily involved with it, but uh, it's already taken off and, and it's so integrated now, you may not have ever really thought about it. But this is an example I like to use. I was telling a, a few uh, people, I mentioned I'm from Georgia, so I usually use this as my example. So if we search for what is the capital of Georgia? I'm sure you know. <laughs> but I want to show you what Google does. This piece right here above the search results is micro content. And this piece over here on the right is micro content. Now, using Google's terms, they call these things featured snippets. So this, they would term this a featured snippet, but a broader term is micro content. Featured snippet is a type of micro content. And Google calls this area on the right the knowledge panel, but a knowledge panel is also a type of micro content. And as you saw in Flare, we can do the exact same thing here and here. So you can decide your content when somebody searches this search string, what you want to show over here, if you want to call a knowledge panel, you can, and what you want to show here. So using our content, just as a quick example, we'll go to, so oh, I already picked on these North American ones. Let's go to Europe. How about London? All right, maybe we've realized that people are searching a lot um, about, uh, I'm just looking here for something interesting. How about this part, the Tower of London? So we realize people search for this a lot. They're looking for this information. We could pick this whole paragraph and make it a micro content block. It doesn't have to be the whole paragraph. You could pick just a sentence. A micro content blocks can be as big or as small as you want. They can have any type of content. But just as an example, what if we wanted to make this a micro content block? In the home ribbon, we can click create micro content. And we need to give it a name. So I'm going to call it London. Right. Now, the phrase is where you're associating it with a search term. So maybe we want to be kind of vague. If someone searches for London, we want to show this paragraph. Okay, so the phrase could be um, just London if you want. So very, that's a very vague one. So what would happen here is if someone searches and anywhere in the search string they use the word London, this would be a match. And we could tell where to show that paragraph here or over here. Now, usually micro content is more focused. That's why it's called micro content. So picking on this one as an example again, maybe you have a sentence that, that just talks about this museum here, the Tate Modern. So imagine you have a sentence that says, Tate Modern is the best museum in London. It's a must see and it's in this area and here it's open from this time to this time, Monday to Friday. And you've realized a lot of people search for Tate Modern because they're trying to find out the times it's open. We already have that in our London topic, but they're not getting to it. You know, it's there's a lot of information on the London topic, and they're they want information specifically about the Tate Modern. We could find that sentence in this topic, highlight it. I don't have that sentence, we're just pretending. And I could make that a micro content block. Now, in that case, the phrase might be Tate Modern, or even what are the hours for the uh, that the Tate Modern is open. So the more specific the phrase is, the better it matches their search term. So it doesn't completely have to match, but the more specific you type in the phrase, the better the matching is. Because I might have a lot of them about the Tate model. I might have one micro content about what are the hours for the Tate model? 
Where is the tape monitor? Uh, how much does it cost? Those could be three different microcontent blocks with three different phrases. And if there are two matches, then one could show here and one could show over here. So microcontent's a really exciting thing. I was telling you, writing is already going more towards writing these microcontent blocks that we then combine into topics that then get combined into our output. So it's already going a, a, a level past topic-based authoring to micro-content-based authoring. That's the next thing. A pretty exciting topic. And you can create that in Flare. Uh, last thing I want to touch on, which will also tie into Central, is, and I mentioned this, Flare has a lot of cool reports in it. Some of them are for troubleshooting. Some of them are for project management. And in Central, there are some cool reports, including troubleshooting and project management, but also analytic reports. In Flare, there are two types of reports. There is this analysis menu with the analysis reports. There's about 75 of these. Some of them are troubleshooting, like broken links. Some of them are just kind of project management so not necessarily that something's wrong, just informational, like, hey, here are all the topics that contain track changes. Or here are topics that you aren't using. You created this topic, but maybe you didn't add it to the table of contents. So maybe it's not, nobody's linking to it. So that can help you kind of manage your whole project. But for those of you that use Flare, you may have used these analysis reports a lot. They're super useful. I use them pretty much every day. But I did want to point out there's a complete another set of reports that a lot of people don't discover on their own. I call them informational reports. So if we go to File New, and for the file type, we select Report. I'm just going to name an example. So in addition to the analysis reports that are pretty easy to find because they're a menu item, if you create a file type of report, there's about 150 of these. So anything you'd possibly want to know about your project. How are you using every image? Uh, how many topics do you have? How many words do you have? How are you using conditions? How are you using variables? How are you using snippets? Are there any variables you're not using? Any conditions you're not using? <laughs> you know, all those combinations, they're all in here. So anything you could possibly want to know, you can make as many of these reports as you want. And once you make them, they are stored in a reports folder and you can run them anytime you want. So that's just a little tip if you haven't checked out these informational reports, super useful, but they are hard to find on your own. So that if you have coworkers that are kind of new to Flare, you might have to show that to them. They may not have ever used those before. Uh, the reports in Central. I have Central open. The unique type of report in Central is user analytic reports. So Central is cloud-based. I have it open here. Let me take it a second. I have to give it a second because of Zoom. All right. So this is just a sample one. It, it's fake content. So this would be an, an example in Central of user analytics. It's showing us, in this case, what people have searched for. So how many times they searched for it all that information. So this might help you identify, hey, we need to write some content, more content about this. Everybody's searching for this word. There's also when people search and there are no results. So that would be definitely something to keep an eye on. So someone's searching for a term and there were no topic matches that would kind of motivate me to write some new topics about those terms. So this is an example of the user analytics built into Central. Uh, in addition to that, in Central, you can also make these reports, which would have, you pick a project, of course, so if you have multiple player projects, and then you can pick which report you want. So a lot of these are going to be troubleshooting, duplicating reports that are in Flare, and you can use this for project management, like assigning tasks to your teammates and things. So you might wonder, well, Okay, just show me I could make a broken links report in Flare. 
And he just told me I could make a broken links report in Central. What's the point? And why would I do it one place or the other? Well, a lot of times these reports in Central are used by team leads that don't even day-to-day -day use Flare. So you might only have a license for Central as the department manager, maybe even someone that manages the department manager, like two levels up in the company. That person might have a Central license just so they can watch what's going on and, and run these reports. They could even build targets. They could assign tasks. So more and more of Central is used, the reporting uh, features in Central are used by managers to manage projects. And they don't even have to have a Flare license. A Central license is way cheaper than a Flare license. So Flare is not super expensive, but a Central license you're talking. You know, a third the cost? <laughs> I think it's a fifth the cost. So that's a cost saving thing. All right, just to wrap up some advanced things. There are ways to automate things in Flare. You can certainly turn on auto save like you have in pretty much every application. And like you have in Word, there is a feature in Flare to replace straight quotes with curly quotes. But you can record simple macros in Flare. I do use that. I have that actually set up here. I have keyboard shortcuts set up to apply heading one, two, and three. So as I'm pressing keys on my keyboard, you can see London is changing size because it is changing between a heading one, two, and three. That's because I made a macro to do that. The macros are not as powerful as macros in uh, Word, but simple things that you might do in the editor, you can record macros. The auto suggest is for variables and snippets. So if I start typing content that matches one of my variables or snippets, like this one matches my variable, it comes up and I press enter and it inserts my variable. So auto suggest is a cool feature with variables and snippets in addition to using the insert menu to insert a variable or a snippet, or possibly using drag and drop, which I do a lot with snippets. Also, if I start typing it, I could insert it. So I want to suggest cool efficiency thing. And over on the customization, there are a lot of customization options for this editor screen. You can show and hide things. They're all, for the most part, hiding under this little eyeball button here. So lots of ways to customize what the editor looks like. The whole interface can be customized. You can move things around. And you can totally customize this interface if you want to. I don't normally do that, but if you wanted to, see, I can make it look pretty crazy if I want to. I just moved it around a little bit. So let's see, I'm, I'm gonna make it look totally different. All right, so I made Flare look a lot different than it did. Maybe I don't like this anymore. And I'm thinking, why'd you do that? All right. You can, if you like it, you can save it like that. I don't really like it like that. But if I did, I could save that. Or I can say reset and put it all back to normal, which is what I'm going to do. So you can customize the interface. It even has sort of a light and a dark. So if you're one of those dark mode people, it doesn't have full dark mode, but uh, I think they're about to add that actually, but you can make it toggle between a darker version and this more lighter version that I have. So you can customize the interface a good bit. There are plugins that you can add because there isn't a basic API with Flare. The most popular plugin is this Kaizen plugin, and I will give you a link to it. I have that, so if you use Flare and you're wondering, what are all these extra menu things that you have that I don't have? That's the Kaizen plugin. It adds all of these. So you can check that out. All right, just to wrap up, if you want to learn more about Flare, I mentioned I have a book about Flare. You can check that out if you want to. There's a blog. There are webinars that are free. They have at least one a month. There's videos and tutorials, white papers. There's a whole conference called Mad World. There's a group on LinkedIn, there's a Slack channel, and there is kind of a help community. 
If you want to interact with other people at Usplayer, I'd recommend starting with the LinkedIn group. It's, it's pretty active. And then if you, you know, really want to talk to people, <laughs> you can get into Slack. You can really jump into that if you want to. All right, so that's all my slides. I see we have a something in the chat. Yeah. Sure, let me go back and I'll switch to the text editor if you have a question about that. Just a second to get over there. Okay, so you have a question about the text editor or comment? Or curiosity, <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so uh, the text editor, which is what I have up now, and again, my screen might be a little small for it. That's the way if you want to go into the X HTML code behind the scenes and change it. So if you're comfortable with that, if you know X HTML or anything, you know, I'd just rather go into it and change it that way rather than dealing with the WYSIWYG view. You can always do that. And there are some things, you know, if you're changing, it might be easier to change it in here. I like having access to it because in some tools, I'll pick on Word again, you can't do that. You know, it's kind of frustrating. I wish I could just go into the code and fix this. Well, you can do that in Flare at least. Then you can do it in other tools, but you know, I always appreciate that. There's nothing hiding. <laughs> some people don't like the names of them. Yeah, uh, I, I think ideally that this one, as most people would call that the WYSIWYG view, then probably the tab should say that. And maybe the other one could say code view. Maybe that's more words that people would be more comfortable with. Uh, other questions or comments or other things you want to see? Anything else on your mind? Just a, a reminder, all the things I've talked through, the whole presentation, everything will be a handout and all the links will have all of that. But anything else you're curious about? Um, how big can a, a snippet be? Well, uh, they can be pretty big. I've seen people make enormous uh, snippets. Um, so there's, there's probably some theoretical limit, but if you're thinking from a, just a page perspective, you know, if you print it out, it could be several pages if that's how big you wanted it to be. Multiple paragraphs, sure. Any other questions? I'll switch back. Anytime, like I said at the beginning, if you ever have a question or, or just want to bounce an idea off of somebody, you can always email me. Uh, my email is right there. So uh, I have a question, um, or maybe it's sort of a, a broad, <laughs> it might be kind of broad. Um, I'm a big fan of find and replace in Flare, uh, which I've used when doing like Microsoft Word. Uh, cleanup when things come in sometimes a little funky uh, is that do you use find and replace often and do you have any tips or tricks for that i'm uh, sure i'll open it up so people can see it so the find and replace in flare it has a lot of cool features to it and there's there's kind of two there, actually there's three options so just to kind of talk about it so the typical find and replace is hey i want to change something and and possibly multiple topics. So you could use a find and replace to do that. It's stuck because of Zoom, so I'll just wait. Eventually it'll come back. <laughs> Zoom's a resource hog. It doesn't like to share. <laughs> yeah. It's coming up. Okay, so here it is. So normal find and replace, you type in what you want to find, what you want to replace it with. Um, just some interesting things. Every once in a while, the find and replace, like in this project, what if I want to find and replace only North America topics? There is a feature in Flare to do that. If you, well, let me change my examples since I have London open, it'll be easier. What if you only want to do this in Europe topics? And London happens to be one of the Europe topics, of course. So if you have one of the topics in the Europe folder open, there is an option here in find in to change it to documents in the same folder. So then it's only going to change other topics in the Europe folder. And that's a pretty useful feature sometimes, exactly what you want to do. Of course, you can some, you know, you can always tell it all topics or just this topic, but being able to do it within a folder is kind of cool. Hiding under the options, if you want to find and replace code, there is an option to do that. And a lot of people don't realize if you know regular expressions, you can do that as well. 
So you can have really powerful binary places in FLIR. So check all these things out. Sometimes you're just looking for something. Like let's say you're looking for everywhere you've added a drop down in FLIR. People overlook this find elements. So a drop down is a feature in FLIR. So you could tell it, hey, find this. You know, this particular tag drop down is called madcap drop down. So if I search for Madcap dropdown, that would find all the dropdowns in my project. So find elements is, you know, it's a special case, but that's also an interesting find. The third one that I mentioned is over in the text editor, there's also a find in the text editor. So if you press control F, there's a find just in the text editor. Yeah. You can see I was doing it <laughs> this morning. So <laughs> Mine's already populated with stuff. Great. Thank you for showing that. Um, it's one of the things I liked best about Flare once I got in there over Word. <laughs> yeah. Okay, up your documentation. Yeah. Any tool that doesn't have this go behind the scenes, you know, get into the code, uh, it's frustrating <laughs> not to be able to do that. All yeah. right. I'm with you. Um, all right, looks like we've had people have had to, to drop off. Uh, we still got a few minutes left, though, if anyone had any questions uh, or if uh, Jessica wants to, to ask specific questions about why Flare works a certain way. I'm, I'm mostly joking, Jessica, but if you have anything, <laughs> you're welcome to ask. Uh, no. <laughs> no, that that was really funny, Bethany. I was thinking, gosh, that, that just opens up a can of worms. But um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of, they, there is something, Scott, maybe you know more about this. It just occurred to me because when I get frustrated with something over and over again, you can log an enhancement request. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, sometimes it takes a year and a half to hear back, but they will let you know if they're, they're planning on implementing it. And I, and I remember by the time I received it, I had no idea what it was. Like, I was like, what is this? And I could, I could barely remember what the problem was, but um, I don't know if you knew anything more about that or you wanted to. I know that's for, for new users, that's not a thing, but sometimes when you're in the middle of using it, you're like, why doesn't it do this? And yeah, that, I just wrote that down on a piece of paper that I'll add. Um, if we go to the help menu up here, there is report a bug. I'll click on it so you, everyone can see what this does. It'll take it just a second to get there. So right from Flair, you can get to this bug submission form. You can also get to this, obviously, it went out to the MADCAP website. So there's a link to it out here. And once you've done it, it remembers. So see how it filled in all my information because I do this all the time. Uh, but just as you're mentioning, if you send in a, a bug report or a feature request, they track it. So let's say you send in something, bug report, feature request, either one, and it's actually, you know, maybe you did something incorrectly, or maybe you misunderstood how the feature works, or maybe the feature is in Flare and you didn't know it. So there's already a, a fix. Then they'll email you right away and say like, oh, you know, here's how to do it, or, or here's what it is. So if it's, if it's actually resolved, it's just kind of a miscommunication, they'll tell you. But, you know, maybe you found something, you have a feature request or a bug, and they need to fix it. They track it. And exactly as you mentioned, at some point, they're going to fix it or add it. And as soon as that version comes out, you'll get this automatic email. So I send in things all the time because anytime someone mentions it when I'm teaching, I log it just like they log it. So when there's a new version of Flare, I get like 20 of these emails um, and you'll get them too. So they are good about following up with you, but I'll send the link to the feature request from the website. I mean, obviously you can click here and type in feature requests, but I'll add it to that learning more page. So y'all have the link to a feature request. And yeah, anybody can send in bug reports or feature requests. You don't have to have a maintenance plan or anything. It's just, you know, anybody can do it. If you have a maintenance plan, then you get a guy or a gal on the phone and then they'll walk through it with you. Exactly. <laughs> That's the key difference. Yeah, maintenance plan, you can call them and they'll talk you through it and share screens and everything. But anybody can use these things. They're free. Uh, so I guess I have a question. It might be in your, oh, Jessica, never mind. Uh, I'll ask mine real quick. Uh, for people who are never have used Madcap Flare or have 
this is their first exposure, what would you recommend they do to learn? Would, they, would you say they should go to the MADCAP website and look at some of their training materials? What would be a good starting point for, for new folks? Um, if you're brand new, you. to, <laughs> if you're brand new to Flair, um, I would I would start by looking through the help just to get that kind of high level overview of what's in it. And the help has, we'll give it a second to come up. So this is the home page of the the help. And over here, I would read through these key concepts and go through these tutorials. The next thing I would do is sign up for the free intro class and go through that. That's going to give you a really good survey of everything you can do in Flare. The intro class doesn't focus on you know, a whole bunch of, it, it shows you how to do things, but it's more of a high level survey of here's all the things you can do and here are the popular features. And then using the help, you could kind of go through it yourself. Uh, after that, if you really want to learn Flare, I would sign up ideally for the intermediate class or, or something like that. But that's going to give you a big leg up and that's all free. The help, the tutorials, the video, and that intro class are all free resources. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I was just tacking on the point. You, someone mentioned a maintenance plan, and, I, and it reminded me um, because uh, when you're purchasing Flare these days, they used to offer like different support packages. I, and, and Stephanie and I, you and I talked about it where mm -hmm. I used to have the bronze sort of like the, the, where you had to email it in. And so you're going back and forth over email. They don't offer that anymore. So if you buy it, you, all, any license, whether it's a subscription or what have you is platinum support where you can do what Bethany described. You can, I think you can even email them your project and they fix it. Am I right, Bethany? Oh, it's, it's amazing. My guy was named Keaton. He was, I think, oh, I, we think we formed a friendship over the course of two years and, and yeah, we would schedule calls with him and show him stuff and he'd say, okay, well, I don't see what it is here, but send over your project and I'll troubleshoot it on my end and get it back to you. So it, it is a, it does add to the cost, but it was so helpful <laughs> when we were getting started, especially setting everything up and trying to do some really complex uh, design. So yeah, I, I have nothing but nice things to say about Madcap's uh, support. Yeah, doing it over email is very rough. Uh, well, yeah, especially <laughs> when you're like, let me send you 50 screenshots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can understand. Yeah, we had to we had to buy a new license and it all it all, all the new licenses come with platinum support. And I I was actually very happy about that. And we had to talk to management and say, yes, we know the price is different, but we have platinum support. And this is a new a person that is new to Flare. So uh, excuse me. Uh, this is Carl. Um, Carl. How much did you pay for that uh, platinum support or for that support? It's part of the package, Scott. I think it, it, you you get a subscription, and and the mm -hmm. support comes with it. Okay, because so there are different prices. We had to, I had to find a license. For, I bought a personal uh, copy. Uh, I have a personal copy of uh, of Flare, and was renewing it every year. And uh, not this year. That's now seven fifty, I guess, for that. And looking online, trying to convince my company to try and do something, it's now two grand. So. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. That's just my complaint for the for the uh, session here. Sorry about that. Yeah, they stopped selling them separate from each other. Uh, now the different prices are based on the different licenses. So you know, there's sort of a I've got my own license, or we have a floating license where we can share it. You know, in other words, like one or two people could be using it at a time, but twenty people could share it. Or uh, I guess you could even buy like a whole bunch of licenses, like a big package for a company if you have like a whole bunch of people. But yeah, the typical, hey, I want a copy that I'm going to use automatically comes with the support bundled into it. And that's why the price went up because it's now comparative to <laughs> you purchase Flare and the, uh, the maintenance. Um, there. The other potential thing you could try as far as the cost is it does come with an update. So let's say, right, let's say you waited till 2023 uh, came out. You'd have that one and the next update. So it's not like, you know, you could space it out a little bit when you upgrade it if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, I see you made a, a comment there and you are correct. I was grandfathered mm -hmm. and I didn't want to spend $750 of my own cash 
So now I've screwed myself. And then if I want to get back into it, <laughs> I'm looking at two grand. So I'm going to go as far as I can with uh, this 2022 R2 and we'll see what happens after that. I understand completely. We just, we, we just renewed at my company and I had to learn about all the different packages, et cetera. But uh, so I, I get that. What kind of, how, how much fun did you have selling it to management with the price increase? Were your guys open or, um, you know, is it, did you tell them it's just the price of doing business? Uh, essentially. And, and we had a, a setup uh, where I had, I've had my flare license for almost 10 years. So mm -hmm. when we had to buy it new, you know, we had to, it was, we sort of were able to explain everything is different now. The license I have was 10 years old, you know, businesses evolved, but right. everybody's changing their license. Everybody's changing their packages. And, and actually the reason I mentioned the platinum support was I did have to explain, you know, I have the brown support and it, it, it was very difficult and platinum support will be worth it one day for that feature of being able to have every someone fix it, et cetera. We haven't gotten there yet, but I, I've had an idea of maybe I'll have the new guy to redesign everything and then he'll troubleshoot it through platinum <laughs> support. Um, so it was a combination of things. It was, hey, you know, we haven't bought a license in 10 years. Obviously there's going to be sticker shock and also you are getting the support with it, which is mm -hmm. incredibly valuable. So yeah, it, it we did have a bit of sticker shock with it. Um, and uh, but it, but again, I think we we are at the advantage that you know ten year price differences. You know, even though we had incremental price increases, you know that we 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 as a software company have definitely um, can't you know ended certain uh, policies that, or programs that we have had. So it was a sort of like, well, they're a software company. We're a software company, right? Software company, <laughs> that, you know, and, yeah, and it's a little easier to do. But it's a great question because it is something you. I did have to talk to my boss and say, um, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. We're uh, just a little bit past time. I was just going to add real quick, Carl. So I've, I've been through the selling, selling flair to management, especially selling it for multiple users <laughs> at the same time. Um, they actually found the, the support to be a compelling part of the use case because their greatest fear was putting a lot of strain on internal resources like IT and and development to do some of like the work of integrating it into our websites. And pretty much I said, we can do it ourselves with platinum, with the platinum support from Flare, uh, knowing we had enough expertise on our team and with with Madcap to help us um, that we would get there. And we did. So they the, the cost in uh, hours saved uh, was was compelling to them. Great. So, Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, so we are past 8, 8.30. Uh, I wanna say uh, thank you so much to Scott uh, for, for being here and, and for sharing so much about Madcap Flair, both for, for new folks and old <laughs> to the tool. Um, and did you have anything else you wanted to close us out with? I know you've got your final slide of links. Uh, no, I, I'm all set. Um, I'm gonna make a couple of updates to this, to this particular page, uh, and then I'll send y'all the handout so you'll have all this information. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone who asked questions in the chat. And uh, hopefully, uh, Scott, we'll, we'll see you again. <laughs> you know, not in hurricane season <laughs> in the future. Uh, so I think that's all we've got for tonight. And also, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing folks at our next chapter meeting on February. Julie usually checks me for dates. I believe the 16th. Uh, it was on my slides. <laughs> Sounds right to me. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you see you soon. But until then, uh, take care, everyone, and and thank you for joining us.